Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to start. So today we are going to learn the engineering of high power amateur rockets. Michael Mickey Mangieri, a senior principal process engineer at Business Transformation Institute Incorporated. I mean, he has a checkered history. And rather than me giving you snippets of it, let me let Tim introduce himself to you. Thank you. All right, so uh, I tend to walk around a lot and stuff. So if I start walking up to you, don't feel like I'm going after anything else. I just like to get comfy and cozy. Um, so really quickly, I mean, if you go out on the web, you can see my bio. So yes, I work at the agency just down the street. And I've been doing that for a long time. I worked at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for a while. I was ground controller for unmanned launchers for a while. I worked with Vitro Labs for a while for the Navy. Uh, I helped design and program the um, uh, naval systems, the cruise missiles, and the SM-2, SM-1 missile systems. Um, I was just telling uh, controller I was got 10 programming languages that I self-taught myself. And uh, my favorite one is still Ada. I still like Ada as my favorite favorite. I had, I had digital equipments Number five, serial number compiler. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, you guys can look at the rest of my bio. Now I work for a company called BTI. Uh, it's run by a, a friend of mine who's the president of the company, Bob Moore. And he was trying to get me to join the company when he first started. And I kept putting it off. I worked for Northrop Grumman at the time. And I finally decided to join with him. So I'm now part owner of the company there. And we're a consulting firm, CMMI, ISO, uh, ISO 9000, you name it. And so we're trying to actually do systems engineering and real stuff in Fort Meade, which is difficult at times. <laughs> but we're trying to do that. So I'm going to talk about one of my hobbies today. So this is one of my two expensive hobbies. My third one is going to be a business, but we'll talk about that after. Um, but so for those of you who have ever dealt with rockets before, especially if you're my age, you probably remember the small SDs of model rockets, right? So there's a little one over there on the table. That's how I got started when I was like six, seven years old. So that's, and then I went up to where we're going to talk about today. So without any further ado, if I can remember how to do this. Uh, so it was a space age hobby started in 1957 by Orville Carlisle. He was a shoe store owner and an amateur pyrotechnician. And he discerned the first model rockets back in 1954. And Harry Stein came along. And he was a science writer and science fiction author. And he added elements to it and formalized it and started up an organization called the National Association of Rocketry. And that's one of the two big organizations that exists today. It's the NAR and uh, the other one is the, is the uh, powerhouse Tripoli Rocket Association or the TRA. So the NAR deals mostly 80% low stuff like SD's rockets, 20% in the high power. Triple rocket, the other side of the coin. They're mostly the high power stuff, and they just do a little bit on the low. So, but both of those organizations pretty much morphed together with each other, and they work collectively. <clears throat> so, here, yep, that's what I just said. So, right now, there's um, from those two organizations, they control the certification levels for all people who want to get into high power rocketry, and so they keep track of the three levels of certification, which I'll go over in a second. Level one, two, three. So I've been a level three for going on <laughs> 10 years now, I think. So. so let's do some definitions first here. Model rocket, weight to maximum of one pound and less than four ounces of propellant. As long as you meet those requirements, you can launch them anywhere you want, any how you want, and nobody's going to bother you. You go above those two values and somebody from any federal agency or local fire agency finds out about it, you can get yourself in trouble. Because now you have to have a certification to do that. Large model rocket, um, weight of about a maximum of 3.3 pounds, motors up to 4.4 ounces of propellant. That's considered a high power rocket. I mean, a large model rocket. A high power rocket, HPR, which we're gonna talk about today, is any size rocket using commercially available APCP or hybrid motors from H to O power. And again, I'll tell you in a little bit what this power means. But O is pretty big. 
Experimental rocket, Tripoli likes to do a lot of these. Uh, these are experimental rockets. They're not commercially designed. The propellants are not commercially made. They're probably made by some group learning how to do it. And so at their launches, they'll say, this is a commercial, this is a experimental only launch. And so you have to be Tripoli uh, certified to do that. Certifications level one, build an airframe, assemble an H motor, fly it, and as long as everything works, you get a level one certification. Level two certification, pass a written test. And the written test involves things such as, do you know how to build a rocket? Do you know all the dynamics of a rocket? Do you know the regulations? Do you know the postal regulations? So it covers all the bases, safety all the way up through the engineering. So you gotta pass that written test. Then you have to build a rocket that's capable of launching on an IJ or K motor. And you gotta successfully recover it, build it back, get it back, got a level two. Next level, level three. Develop a real project plan, full engineering drawings. Mine was like 300 PowerPoint slides. Demonstrate that you know what you're doing, build a rocket. It has to be a dual deployed rocket. It has to have electronics to bring the, open the parachutes and stuff. And it's going to be launched and you have to assemble an M-class motor. If you successfully do that, that's the last level of certification. At that point, you can build any rocket, any size you like. You wanna put one in orbit, there's nothing keeping you from doing so. And there are a couple of groups that are now trying to actually do that. And I don't know the young lady in the back there, but she was mentioned she was the student rocket. That there are groups, including hers, <laughs> that are building some serious rockets that are trying to, one, I think the highest one so far reached 130,000 feet successfully. So, some serious stuff. Flight dynamics, let's talk a little bit about engineering. So, you got several phases, you got your liftoff. The neat thing about the liftoff is after the liftoff, everything's out of your control. <laughs> Once the thing is fired, that's it. You have no more control, everything is autonomous from that point on. Powered flight, the time that the rocket's being accelerated by the motor, burnouts when the motor burns out, and then coast, and by the way, it coasts quite a long ways. Usually the amount of altitude it covers during burning time is very small percentage-wise. Uh, it builds up a lot of velocity and a lot of momentum and a lot of uh, kinetic energy, and it's just gonna use it all up until it gets to its highest point, come back down. Apogee is the point that it's gonna reach when it gets up there. And then the descent phase, which is, by the way, the most critical part of the whole thing, because if you don't have the design right and you don't have the electronics working right and that parachute doesn't come out, then a rocket that went up at 600 miles an hour probably gonna come down at close to 600 miles an hour, and you don't want that to happen. What governs the flight of a rocket? The thrust, force that pushes up the backside, wants to make it go up against Earth's gravity. Gravity is the attractive force that we all know of. That's trying to pull it back down. And then of course we have the drag forces due to the fact that we have an atmosphere on this planet and rockets that start gaining velocity, the drag force is increased by the velocity squared. So the faster that rocket goes, the more those drag forces really start to build up. And so building a rocket that can reach high altitudes in high power rocketry is designing them in such a way that you can minimize the amount of that drag because there's not a whole lot you can do about the gravity part. And that's kind of fixed, right? In case you're wanted to make sure that this is a true engineering presentation. I've thrown at least a copious amounts of engineering out equations and algorithms in there for you. You want me to explain them? That's fine, but we probably don't have the time today to do that. But these are they, and you'll see they are the, um, whoops, I went too fast here. And now I'm going in the wrong direction. There we go. There it is. I knew I had a laser pointer, just didn't know where it was. So there's the drag equation. There's the force equations of motion. And there's a need to put these things on a, what's known as a launch rail, something that guides it for a while, not very long, just about eight to 12 feet, because rockets of these type have no gyros. 
And so they need to get up to 44 feet per second before the fins will start stabilizing the rocket's trajectory. So they've got to be told which way to go until they get up to that velocity. Once they're at that point, they'll continue to go up straight. You're in good shape. So again, fin stabilized. Um, the design of the fins, how big they have to be, where they have to be on the rocket, the airframe, mass ratios, how much mass you put in front versus the back. You can play around with those until you get a design you like. Um, a lot of people in clubs and rocket clubs, including myself, like to take existing real missiles from the military and build our own scale versions of them. Well, you know, a lot of those use gyros, and so we have to do some funky stuff to get it to work and keep put out big, big fins on the guys and make it look silly. So um, there's a ways to do that. We'll talk a little bit about that too. <clears throat> Two things you got to know about the engineering of, uh, of rocket dynamic to fly properly. As long as the center of gravity of the rocket, point where it balances, is in front of the center of pressure, the point where if you actually held anything by the center of pressure point and let air flow by, it would stay there like a wind vane. Right? So as long as the center of gravity is up front, and center of pressure is behind, it's stable. You remember bottle rockets when you were a kid? Bottle rocket had the rocket at the very top, no fins, but it had a nice long stick. <laughs> so what it was doing, it was putting all the weight at the top, and that stick was producing enough area behind it so that the center of pressure was way behind. And so it went up fairly straight, more or more loud. But to do a decent rocket, you got to make sure that those equations work. If they happen to be equal, CG and CB are right on top of one another, then you're known as critically stable. As long as it's going in the right direction, it'll probably keep going that way. But as soon as anything tells it to go somewhere else, it'll decide to go that way. <laughs> so when gust of wind comes along, now it's moving in that direction. So you got to be watch this. We have software today. <laughs> <laughs> that just runs on a laptop and does all this ca calculations for us. And so these are the equations of motion for all the attributes of a rocket in flight over those six different uh, phases of its rocket's flight. And these are the dynamics for the recovery. So it's important to know how big of a parachute do you need for the size of rockets and the mass of the rocket to get it down safely. Um, it's actually hard to bring a rocket down under 20 feet per second even under a chute. So ranges that launch high power rockets this size and bigger, they usually have a very large safety area where no one's allowed to go out there because even coming down under a big parachute, 20 feet per second, you got a 40 pound rocket, it could hurt your noggin, it hits you. So we've had some cases where some rockets have come down and landed on spectators' cars or parked in the flight line. Not good, no. But I've gotten some of them to go down as little as 15 feet per second, but it's really tough, really tough. RockSim is one of the software products that I use. RockSim is a CAD package that allows you to design a rocket right on the computer every single component you're going to put in there it'll determine where it is how much you know, you tell it how much it weighs where is it located which is dimensions roxim is automatically keeping the calculations behind the scene telling you where the center of gravity is where the center of pressure is making sure it's stable or not and then when you get it to where you like it it'll also run simulations launch it and show you what it will do under various conditions in the real world so you input the wind speed, the expectation for what you're going to see in the real world. It'll tell you what the rocket's going to do. So before I ever get to the field, I'm pretty darn confident that if the motor ignites and it's pointing up at the time, it will go straight up and it will come back down. Somebody I was talking at the dinner and said, you know, Mikey's going to talk about rockets and I don't think he's ever lost any. You know, we have a saying at the club, you know, Rockets go up, they will come down. <laughs> it's just how do they come down? But they will come down. And yes, I have lost quite a few. Uh, I was up in upstate New York at a big event. Um, I was actually on the Discovery Channel. Um, they were filming my launch. 
the rocket was an Acme rocket, so it was one of those crooked rockets that you saw from the Acme uh, Roadrunner cartoons. Uh, it was about 12 feet tall. It's, it was $3,900 worth of stuff, and it got lost in the woods somewhere. So I'm still convinced somebody out there found it and put it in their garage. Because <laughs> I looked for two days trying to find it. After the fact, all the rockets will, uh, and you're free to come down here later on if you like, but all my rockets carry altimeters that control when the parachutes come out, but they also capture flight data. And so when you get the rocket back, you can analyze the flight data and find out exactly what the performance of that rocket was. How high did it go? How fast is it moving at any time? Uh, where did certain events occur? You can see where this particular one, um, this is the um, emerald fire, which is what you're looking at here. This is the coefficient of drag as the thing increased speed. So you can see where the drag forces all of a sudden started really, really taking effect. And you can do some other stuff here. Here's where the parachutes popped out. You see the spike. So here it is descending without a very small parachute. Then the main parachute comes out when it gets fairly low, and now it's descending even slower. And so these are all things that you can do after the fact uh, to increase the performance of the rocket, or just because you're interested in seeing what's going on. Let's talk about the main areas of engineering these guys. So the airframe, they can be either single stage, cluster, or multi-stage. Single stage, similar to the one out here. One motor, one airframe, goes up, comes down. Cluster, similar, except it has more than one motor in the base. Cluster. Multi-stage, two, three. Nobody does more than three stages around here. But uh, you can go up to multi-stage. And most of these are for wow factor. All right, they get harder and harder to do, but boy, they're cloud, crowd pleasers when you go out to clubs and launch them. So we'll talk a little bit about airframes. We'll talk about the nose cones, fins, how you put these things together, et cetera. What are they made of? Well, surprise, surprise. Even some high-power rockets are simply made out of cardboard. Now, it's reinforced cardboard. Usually it's double-walled, or I cover it with fiberglass cloth and epoxy, so you can literally stand on it. But uh, it's, it's lightweight, it's easy. Phenolic. Magnaframe, a company produced a special phenolic that's got uh, vulcanized fiber embedded in it, so it gives a little bit. It's not as brittle as phenolic. If you're familiar with phenolic, it cracks very easily and um, makes repairing them hard. Uh, filament wound fiberglass is what that emerald fire is. So that has no cardboard. That whole rocket is fiberglass, all filament wound fiberglass. Carbon fiber, you want to get your weight down, go for it. Carbon fiber is the ultimate. Super strong, really, really light. really, really expensive. <laughs> so a tube of carbon fiber as big as the Emerald Fires tube running around $200 to $300 or more. So they get up there. So here's, this, here's a um, exploded diagram of, uh, this looks very close to mine. Uh, the airframe, the payload, the nose cone, that's a single stage. There I am with the rocket at our field out there. And um, let's see, where was that? Thing. Yeah, this is my club out in the eastern, eastern shore. So it's MDRA's field. Cluster designs, single state with multiple motors. Whether or not they all light at the same time is up to you. Uh, there's a technique known as air starting clusters. That's a real cloud, crowd pleaser. And what you do is you put a really powerful motor in the center and you have it lift off onto that one motor. And then when it gets up a little ways, that motor gives way. And all of a sudden, the outboard bore light in the sky. and Really cool. Yeah. Um, how you do those clusters and why you do them, most of these are for sport. Um, you can get pretty high with clusters, but again, you're adding extra cost to the flight by doing that. They can get exotic. So here's one of my um, rocket that has two canted things on it. Flies under two, powers up. Goes up. The reason they're canted that way, does anyone know? More than just for show. 
If one of those fails to light, it's still going to try to drive the center of gravity up straight. So either one of them works, it's going to go straight up. Whereas if they were both parallel and they were separated, if one didn't ignite, you got an unstable condition. This is going to try to drive it off to the side. Multi-stage, just what you might expect. There's a booster. In the second stage, it'll ignite after the booster's finish, continue its flight. These can go very high. And so you don't see a lot of these being done at our club in, in Maryland because we don't have very big fields in Maryland. And uh, you don't want to get them out into the landing on people's houses. That would be a no-no. <coughs> Nose cones. Three basic types, parabola, ogive, and cone. Uh, without going into a lot of detail about them, here's a little diagram of what they look like. And surprisingly, if you're going to go supersonic, you really want a cone shape. If you want to go subsonic, you want elliptical or ogive or the von Karman variants of those. Happens to do with the way the air currents flow through the nose cone surface. And um, I usually pick these guys. Um, metal tips recommended if you're going supersonic. It's amazing how hot the outside surface of a rocket can get when it hits Mach 1. We usually put crayon or wax or something on our fins and the nose cone to prove to people that it actually hit Mach 1. Because it comes back and all of it's melted. Uh, one of my club members had a rocket similar to that with all that fancy wrapped. Because this is not painted on, this is actually the um, same stuff you get on cars uh, for wrapping your car wrapped around there. Then go supersonic, that stuff starts peeling away <laughs> and melting. Fin design basic is the delta. Um, ellipticals, um, so no sharp surfaces. They're high performance fins. They will produce the least drag for area fin. Um, three or four fins are typical. Two is not enough. Because there's going to be an orientation where it'll look like that. And that's not going to stabilize very well. So three or four is good. Can be strange looking. As long as they meet the requirements of doing the right center of pressure versus center of gravity, you're okay. There is something that could happen to you called fin floater. High performance, high velocity rockets can exhibit this fin flutter uh, anomaly, which says once you reach Mach 0 0.8 to 0.85, the air currents start producing a unstable resonance in the fin. And when you get close to Mach 1, that can really, really start taking effect. And so you don't want that to happen because fin can actually destroy itself and fall off. Later today, uh, the end of the presentation, I have a video. I'll show you what happens when fin flutter goes bad. And so one of the easiest ways to eliminate that, oops, I keep hitting the wrong buttons, is laminate two different materials together. So take a fiberglass fin and put a little thin sheet of plastic or wood or whatever, cross it differently. They have different moments of inertia and different resonance frequencies, and they'll cancel each other, pull them together. I told you that some rockets can be built out of cardboard. And so some of the mistakes you can make, and you know, I'm, I'm not impervious to mistakes. So I was at a rocket launch once where I had a design for a rocket that was a cardboard body. It was not going to get any close to Mach. It was going to reach Mach 0.6 tops. And then the motor I had had a problem, couldn't get it to work. So what did I do? Instead of looking at my research and my notes to find out what appropriate motor I could use, I said, well, I got this motor. I'll put that one in it. So I did. We launched it. It went up. The launch control officer's watching it. And he goes, oh my gosh, it's doing a little shake and dance. And then it settled out. And I went, why did it do that? And I went, oh. <laughs> so here is a cardboard rocket that hit Mach 0.9. <laughs> it was almost ready to self-destruct. <laughs> when I got it back, it had micro fractures throughout the entire body. It was just about ready to go 
south. Motor retention, amazing topic on motor retention. There's all kinds of ways to do this. What's motor retention? Well, just what it says, it's keeping the motor in the rocket, doesn't fall out. So you gotta have some way to keep it in there. When the thrust is going, it's pushing up. It's gonna stay in there. But as soon as that thrust stops, and the rest of the rocket's moving, there's gonna be a downward force, but you gotta retain it. So you can get exotic with those two. Um, this gentleman here has got his own machine shop so he literally turned his own aluminum rings and made a perfectly good uh, motor retention for that guy. This is actually a quarter scale of the Patriot missile. It's been launched a number of times at our club. So, and it's a, <clears throat> it's a five engine cluster combination. Shock cords. Well, we got lots of pieces of rockets. We got the nose cone, the midsection, the, the booster section. How do you keep all these things together? Well, you put together a Kevlar or tubular nylon, 40, 60 foot long, good, powerful, quick links. So you literally tie it all together so that it all comes down in one long string of, of stuff. Nose cone at the top, all the way down to the motor at the base. And so that holds it all together. And of course, they have to be fireproof because the way you're blowing the chutes out and the way you're separating this stuff is with 4F black powder. And so you got to protect against the corrosiveness of the black powder as well as the heat. Interstage couplers, you gotta keep, you're gonna do two stage rockets, you're gonna have to keep them together somehow. And designing how you keep them together can get pretty complicated. Um, for the hobby, dual stage, multi-stage rockets have been not a lot of people doing them because it gets tough to do this right. A lot of times they get stuck and they stay together or they come off early, that's not good either. Um, so there's different techniques to do that. Some of the simpler techniques is to just simply put four steel rods in there and four holes in the other one and slide it through together. And you're in good shape. <clears throat> Let's talk about propulsion. So what do we use for fuel? So if you're familiar with the space shuttle, you know, the solid rocket boosters in the space shuttle use ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, AC, PC, and that's what we use too. Same stuff. In fact, there was a period of time when the space shuttles were launching pretty frequently that, you know, the government, NASA, bought all the, <laughs> all the propellant up. We were having a hard time getting ours. Um, there's also hybrids. Uh, it uses a combination of nitrous oxide gas and anything else you like. Normally what we do is we chop up PVC pipe small pieces. Just drive some nitrous oxide gas through there and light it, off it goes. Put a baked potato in there, I've seen them do that. Still works, anything you like. Uh, motor cases, how do you hold all the stuff together? Aluminum, uh, usually they're spun aluminum, aircraft aluminum. I got some samples over here on the table you can take a look at. Uh, hybrids are very complicated because they got gas containers, valves, seals, all kinds of stuff. So composite propellant means that both the fuel and oxidizers are mixed with a rubbery compound uh, and we call them fuel grains and they're literally cylinders of fuel with a whole core punched through the center. And sometimes it's one, two, three, up to eight or nine cores go together into a rocket motor to uh, make up the actual full engine itself. And because we are a sport hobby, we like the fact that manufacturers are now designing all kinds of fancy motors that produce colors. So we have red line motors that produce bright red flames, different characteristics of thrust as well. Blue line motors, blue, blue flames. Guess what rocket motor the Emerald Fire uses? Green flame. <laughs> so we actually, uh, so they have red, blue, green, pink, when we did the cancer thing for the pink ribbons, they actually made a line of motors that produced pink flames. It's just a, an example of what a hybrid motor would look like. Again, more complicated because you've got the gas that has to build up in here. You've got your O-rings in the back. You have a vent. Once you pressurize this guy, it's, it wants to go. So if it sits on the pad too long, you've got to vent all the gas out and start over. And uh, I have not delved into hybrid at all. I just, 
that's not going to, I'm not going to get involved in that. Motor cases, tube with threaded ends, that's all it is. There's a Coke can here to give you some idea how big these guys can be. And they have a closure at the base and they have a closure at the top. The closure at the base has the nozzle in it. Closure at the top, usually completely sealed off. And the reason they're threaded inside the tube and not outside the tube is to prevent explosion. So if something happens to a motor and the nozzle gets clogged, because they're threaded inside, the tube itself will expand and then the closures will blow out. Now, that's good because you don't have a big massive explosion blowing stuff all over the place, but it's bad for your rocket because now all the fuel is gonna go out the top and not good for the material. But it's a safety thing, which is why they do it. Here's a typical high power motor in its design. Uh, so here's your fuel grains. Here's the inner sleeve that goes inside the metal sleeve. Here's the rings. Yes, we do have O-rings, just like the space shuttle did. Do they fail? They sure do. You'll see a video of what happens when an O-ring fails. And there's about, um, I think, 60 or 70 different brands of motor out there now today that you can get. Thrust profile, each motor is characterized by a thrust uh, profile. We talk about things, total impulse, that's the amount of thrust times the amount of time in which it burns. But there's a particular profile of burn time that it looks. Most of it is a lot of initial thrust to build up initially to get the momentum of the rocket off the pad, and then it'll drop off while it's burning the rest of the way. So you'll see a lot of these curves will peak and then drop and then die off when they burn out. Some of them will rise way up and just drop right back. Some of them will peak up way high and drop back in less than a fraction of a second. Those warp motors, which I don't like. It's like a gun. You know, you, you like a gun, go out to a shooting range. Don't launch a rocket that goes boom. So I'm, I'm in the slow and low variety. I like mine to take off reasonable, fast enough to be stable, but slow enough that you watch it. And I like to be able to see it all the way. So I don't want to go too high either. Slow and low is my, my thing. Motor classifications. I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. I know everybody likes the video, so I want to make sure I have time to show the video. Motor classifications go up from a quarter A. Every time you jump up a letter, you're doubling the power of a motor. So if you remember, the Estes days, the model rocket days. So they had A motors or B motors or C65s. So every time you went up a letter, you doubled the power. So looking at this chart, you'll see the Estes stuff usually tops out at D. Mid power goes E, F, and G. Once you pass G into H, you're now in high power range. And we're doubling every time. So here's your impulse limit, 40, 80, 160, all the way down to an O, which is 40, 41,000. That is a one powerful motor. It's about that round and that tall. And we just launched one that had six of those. <laughs> you could feel the ground shake. Motor sizes, anywhere from 29 millimeter up to 152 millimeters. And that's the diameter of the actual casing. So the Emerald Fire over there has a 75 millimeter, um, 75 millimeter called a three inch motor. And that's the K through M power. And that guy usually goes off on an L or an M. If I put it on an L, I can see it and watch it the whole time. If I put it on an M, I get a pair of binoculars out. That's pretty darn high. That's a relatively small rocket for an M. How do they work? So here's your fuel grains. Here's your assembled rocket with the fuel grains inside. The igniter goes all the way to the top. So it comes in the back through the nozzle 
And it's essentially a, um, some material on the front of that thing could be thermite. Most of the times it's some other form of, of material that can burn pretty rapidly and hot. It has a match, electric match that ignites it off. And that sits all the way at the top because you want the motor to start burning at the first grain at the very top, let the flame go down the motor and ignite all the other grains. And then the thrust blows out. If you launch, if you put the igniter down at the very base, what ends up happening is it tries to blow out the nozzle and it gradually tries to make its way up the motor and it ends up what we know as chuffing. It'll sit on the pad going, it's like, okay, come on, come on, come on, go, go. And it'll keep doing that until it finally builds up enough power to get all the grains burning. Problem with that is it's used up a whole lot of fuel while it's sitting there. <laughs> so that's why they're sitting way at the top. <clears throat> okay, so that's how we get them up. Now, how do we get them back? You can use what's known as single or dual deployment. Single deployment means the parachute is ejected at the highest point, and that's it. So as high as that rocket's going to go, that's when the parachute pops out and it comes down. Now, if you're in Nevada, where you've got a desert that goes on from 20 miles, so what? Opens up and it drifts in the wind, 10 miles away, you go drive and go get it. On the East Coast, there are no fields bigger than that, <laughs> maybe a half a mile. So we do what's known as dual deployment, and some folks have called that East Coast recovery. And that's where we use all the electronics. So the rocket goes up, it comes down under a very small chute, and the emerald fire, in fact, doesn't even come down on the chute. It just separates the sections, so it's not a missile anymore. And it just kind of wobbles around sky, falling down pretty fast, around 100 and some feet per second. But it comes straight down at 100 and some feet per second. Wind's not going to carry it very far. And then the altimeters determine when you get to 800 feet, blow the charges and blow the main six-foot chute out, and then it goes, and then for the next 800 feet, even if it drifts a couple thousand feet, no big deal, it's still well within the field. And so that's the difference between the two, depending on how you want to do it. Dual deployment, a whole lot more complicated than single deployment, but for our area in the woods, got to do it that way. And this is notionally what it looks like. So here's a rocket going off. There it is at the top. First event just opens up. Wind carries it a little bit, and the main chute opens up, and it comes down the rest of the way. Safe landing, everybody's happy. Get to launch it again. Rip style nylon is the material usually used for the chutes. Uh, we do use black powder charges to pop them out. Uh, some people have been using CO2 cartridges as well. It's a little safer. Um, no burning material to worry about. Um, but it's still cheaper and easier to do with black powder. So here's a classic deployment, what it all looks like. So this is my um, Talon rocket, the Talon II, which is about 10 feet tall and about this round, much bigger. This is what I got my level three certification on. And this is it coming down. And you can see the long, long parade of things in here. There's the booster, there's the drogue chute, there's the midsection, the nose cone protector and a big shoot at the top. So electronics, all kinds of electronics being used in here. Most of the altimeters are available today. They're not very expensive anymore. You can pick up some of these altimeters as little as 30, 40 bucks. Uh, the most expensive one shown up there right now is this one, about 130 bucks. And they will control up to four different um, Four different output channels. So you can do other stuff besides blow shoots out. You can set experiments to go off, temperature probes to go out, whatever you want to do. Um, but most of these are used to both control the when the events take place for safe recovery, as well as capture the data for analysis later. Electronic bays, how do you put all this electronics in a rocket, depending on what type of rocket you've got? The classic is a typical centerpiece where the base of the rocket, the booster section of the rocket hangs off this end, 
and the top part with the nose cone hangs off this end. So the piece in the middle, it's over here as an example, the piece in the middle actually contains all the electronics. Um, you can get a little bit more exotic with these if you have to. So here is the ill-fated uh, Roadrunner thing that I lost. <laughs> and so it had a whole section inside that was devoted to just the electronics. And it had one of these, one of these, two in the back, one over the side, these two. Just this section alone, I ended up with about $1,100 worth of stuff lost. So it, it can be expensive if you want to do it. Um, it doesn't have to be that expensive. You can launch some high power rocket like this under 300 bucks. Data analysis, just another example of it. Staging computers. Um, staging computers are extremely important because one of the things you want to make absolutely sure, you know, multi-stage rocket, when that booster goes off, there's no guarantee that it won't veer off course. And one of the worst things you can have is the second stage of a rocket looking like this, launching that way, horizontally. So you want to make sure there's a way to prevent that from happening. So staging computers are the way to do that. They're designed to determine what is that tilt angle, and they will shut down the second stage entirely if the tilt is more than whatever you preset. And we usually preset five or, ten or eight degrees. It goes beyond that. Okay, so it's not a full flight, but nobody's going to get hurt. It's going to come down in a parachute, low altitude. GPS. GPS is if you really want to get interesting with these. There's uh, one that's used here is on the front table here. That's an older model. Now they make them one-fifth the size. But uh, GPS will do everything the altimeters will do, plus do some research for you, do some interesting things for you. So here is the last flight of the Emerald Fire a few years back where the full GPS was in operation. And after the fact, the file that comes out of these um, telemetry GPS units can be mapped into Google Earth. And you can actually see the three-dimensional profile the rocket took during its flight. And then you can do some real science, real engineering, like what happened here. Coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. All of a sudden it goes like that, it goes like that, it goes like that, and it comes down. That's because there was a wind shear right there. So it picked up on the wind shear. And here it's just telling you how fast it's going at each one of those points. So you can do some cool stuff with GPS. Another nice thing about GPS is if it goes out of range, you don't know where your rocket is, get out your little thing and it'll tell you where it is. Go there. <laughs> so it transmits signals back every quarter second, telling me where and what the uh, rocket's currently doing. A more sophisticated version of this, which I have on order, um, a friend of mine in my club has already been using it. Um, actually, you sit with a laptop, and if you're one of those people who doesn't want to actually watch the real thing in the air, you can look at the laptop, and it's going to tell you velocity, acceleration, current altitude, current position, and real time on Google Earth exactly where it's going. Well, I like to call it a mini NASA. I'm the guy who likes to watch it. All right. I think I lost connection. It's stuck. There we go. So here's what that advanced tracking system we talked about. And um, this will actually talk to you, too. So it'll be telling you what your rocket's doing besides showing it to you. All these things just came out recently, uh, the last few years, um, just from the advances in um, uh, electronics and technologies. Cost, uh, contests and events, Team America Rocket Challenge. I'm a mentor for that organization. So uh, mid-school, high school students every year get together and there's a specific challenge, set of requirements to have to meet. Really, you might be familiar with this. Really good engineering. They're told, here are the parameters. You gotta launch two eggs. You gotta get them to exactly 800 feet. It has to do that in exactly 60 seconds. And you gotta bring them back totally intact. Design a rocket that's gonna do that. And go at it. And there's usually 800 teams that compete during the year. 
and 100 of them are the semifinalists go out to Virginia, and then they pick a winner. Uh, my club has the yearly Red Glare event. Whoops. Okay, we're going to the video. <laughs> all right, so this is what you're all waiting for, right? If it'll run. Try this again. Here we go. So I'll fill you in on some of these as we're going. <clears throat> this is Kip's Mike Corona, an N booster and an M sustainer. Onboard video on it. And you'll see in a second when the booster cuts off. And the sustainer goes. Even in the video, you can actually see the booster coming down in the background. Not reaching out to the 15,000 feet in just a few seconds. Pretty soon, it's going to turn over to Apogee. And lo and behold, for those flat earthers, you'll actually see the earth is not flat. Yeah, it's actually curved. This is an interesting air start. There's two motors there in the center, the guys putting in. That's what it's going to boost off the ground with. There's two on either side of it. They're going to air start once it gets up in the air. And this is our big red Walmart. So those are red line motors. You see the little red flame. And it coasts a little bit. And the sustainers take place. Now, it looks like it's actually doing that. It's, it's just perspective. It's really still going straight up. This is Kevin Mitchell, one of our team guys out here in Maryland. Insane. That ignites multiple motors at different times. And then for this one, you can actually see it coming over the top, and then the parachute gets blown out. The bad, which really means the really cool stuff. Yes, we do drag racing. First to the top gets a point, first off to the pad gets a point, and the last to land gets a point. All right. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about fin flutter. Here's the speed, 500 feet per second. Now watch the fin. Right now it's getting close to mock. Pretty amazing, huh? Here's a double stage at our club in Eastern Shore. Three, two, one. Oh, two this is the one that reached, I think, uh, yeah, 121,000 feet. Since then, it's been beat. Um, these are custom experimental design, all built by the group. We don't fly these on the Eastern Shore. Takes a while to get to the top. Pretty close to the edge of space. There goes the uh, charge to blow the shoot out. There goes the nose gun. It's everything. Oh, yeah! Yeah! 121,000 feet. And of course, Sometimes they don't go right. See the fin flutter? I mean, that time it, they came off. Remember that Patriot I talked about? Three quarter scale Patriot? 2013, it did not have a good flight. One of the forward closures blew an O ring. And of course, it blew all the other motors along with it.
That's what happens when the forward closure comes out really early. Roman candle. A little bit of pyrotechnics. Now watch the nose cone on this rock. <laughs> Came off. And it's fine until it gets to Mach 1. And at Mach 1, Rockets don't fly well at Mach 1. <laughs> they have no nose cone. And of course, Steve Eves back in uh, 2009 at our club, a special event was hosted by the media. 5,000 people there at the launch built a one tenth scale replica of the Saturn V. We had to build a special 40 foot gantry tower to launch and hold the thing. And he launched that successfully on, I think, nine motors. Didn't go very high, but it was pretty darn impressive. Took five shoots to bring it down. One of them didn't open. And that is now on display at Huntsville, Alabama, NASA. They asked for it. Yeah, this is right on the eastern shore of Maryland. Hmm? Uh, it's 33 feet tall, huh? Yes, it was the largest small amateur rocket ever launched. And this past year, that record was broken again by somebody affiliated with our club. Yeah, you can get them. So I think that is it. Yep, that's it for the presentation. So that's how you build. I don't, I don't think you're going to all leave here today knowing how to build a high power rocket, but at least you get an idea of what it might entail. And uh, if we got time, I'll entertain questions. Other questions? Let me, uh, while they're answering questions. Uh, all right, Mikey. No, that's okay. Go how ahead. do you actually ensure that you're not interfering with any low flying aircraft or anything that's coming through? Yeah. I mean, so, is there. Uh, Everyone's pre-warned? Yes, yes. Okay. The club takes care of all the requirements. One of the requirements is we have to file what's known as a noticed airman, or okay. NOTAM, which tells uh, aircraft to stay out of this region of airspace for duration of a certain period of time uh, because of the events that are taking place. We've found out that that simply tells them to come by and watch. And they tend to fly over even more often. Uh, but we do that for the larger flights, for the big ones like the Saturn, and for the two stagers that go up really high, we actually get FAA clearance and we get a window to launch it in. So we're going to launch between 2 and 2.15, and that's where we're allowed to launch. There was one case when a medevac helicopter disobeyed all the no-tim rules and went flying across our field at 600 feet. And one of these big rockets was coming down with all that shroud material. If that hit his blades, it would have taken that copter down. And he just pulled out of the way in time. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. I didn't look at the charts too closely, but how many Gs do these things experience? Oh, accelerations. Yeah. Um, most of these guys go off at about anywhere from four to eight or nine Gs plus. And um, some of the smaller ones, the real high performance sport ones, can go up even higher than that. Um, you got to be careful with super high accelerations because if they're not built to sustain it, you're going to suffer. The club has what's known as a um, mock contest and speed contest to see if anyone can hit mock the fastest. People who know how to engineer the rockets are coming with their spun fiberglass with reinforcing. Other people build kits right out of the box and want to put a big motor in it and do it. They usually end up in bags later. <laughs> I, I had a second question. Do you also... You know, try to 
do something maybe near dawn, so then that we get maybe more effect about the watching the flames and stuff like that come out the back end and you know a little more of a light show say it that way oh yeah i mean I, what i didn't show here to um i could have is there are some motors called sparky motors that actually has magnesium powder in them and when they go off you got this huge blown out stuff of black smoke gold stuff burning and stuff the only problem with that is it gets really impressive to look at but in the summertime when the grass in the field is dry so we literally set about an acre and a half of the farmer's field on fire once because of that. <laughs> so, so I have a quick question. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't think of trying to put any command and control stuff into this to control no, it? No, there's actually some regulations that prohibit a lot of modern uh, stabilization controls. Okay. Uh, we run afoul of the, um, you know, the terrorists. You know, you, what are you doing? You're making a missile? Is it going to fly? You know? Okay. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that they make it perfectly hard to do. And a lot of times it's, it's you know, it doesn't really add anything. Uh, most of these that are fin stabilized, they're done right. They work just fine. There is one guy, I forget who his name is. Um, one of the things that's always getting to me, especially now at my age, is I do not like to go tramping a mile and a half in the woods trying to find the rocket and bring it back. I'm, I'm getting to that age where I just can't do that anymore. So I said, wouldn't it be nice if we can get it to come back to me? And he's devised and he's experimented with this and he's got it to work fairly well. Now he's got to get this, the, it's too big. He's got to get it down to fit an airframe. But the same idea of a parasail, he's merged the parasail concept with electronics and remotes so that you can actually bring it back. If homes in on the GPS signal where it launched from, and it comes back. He's done it on a moderate scale, but not yet for prime time. <laughs> I have a question about. Uh, okay. Sorry, I have a question about certification. You have the, all these different uh, certification levels, and then I also saw the simulation where you could just pop in the numbers and build your rocket. Now, how much do you have to know about all those numbers during the certification, or can you just take the the, the program and just make your Rocket. Okay, so for the certification one, you don't have to know nothing. You just build a rocket, launch it. Certification two, you have to know enough about those numbers, not all the physics behind them, but for instance, the key points, like there'll be a question on the exam that'll say, where does the CP versus the CG go for a stable rocket? So you have to know the concept, right? The, the, the software and stuff will take care of figuring that out for you. For level three, now you gotta know the stuff. You gotta know, for instance, I glossed over a lot of things in here. Uh, you have to know what's the amount of black powder to use, how much pressure you have to put into the chamber to blow it out at altitude. You got shear pins holding the nose cone to the airframe. You don't want to fall off like that one did in the video. So you got shear pins. Well, how much force of the black powder do I need to make sure the pins get sheared off, et cetera. So all that comes into that exam. They're saying the number two is you can certainly most people could probably qualify for that with a little studying, yep. where number three is really going to be science. Yeah, number three, not only do you have to know all this stuff, you've got to build a project plan. You have to have two certified level three members of an organization, either Triple E or TRA, that will mentor you along the way, and you have to show them as you're going, as you're developing this, what your plans are, where you are. And then at the field, they're going to spend a number of hours with you looking over the whole rocket, its design, how you did it, how you built it, before they'll let you launch. So then the other question would be, what would the cost be of a level two rocket, you know, let's say a typical rocket that you can get into? Level, level two rockets you can do as cheaply as 40 bucks. Um, maybe a little bit more because some of the casings have gotten a little bit higher priced. But you get single use rockets that don't even need a casing. So you put those in there. So a level two anywhere from 30 $40 up to a few hundred dollars. Um, Level three, you're probably going to start off at five, six hundred bucks and work your way up from there. The fuel, the fuel for this guy, fill this thing to launch this guy on an M motor, it's four hundred dollars just for the fuel. So I, I tell people it's sort of like, you know, you buy an HP laptop for four hundred dollars and it just lasts for three years. I buy fuel for my rocket and it burns in three seconds. <laughs> Okay, so before I uh, 
get get the raffle draw. I just want to make sure has everybody got a raffle ticket. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So, first and foremost, thank you very much, Mickey. It was a great talk. Oh. And give him a big hand. I have a small souvenir for you.